Well, now, now we're going to go from that to actually the Sukkot, the, the tent in the wilderness, the tabernacle that the people have been building for thousands of years. And the early church, remember, they were, they were Jewish for, for quite a while. And so they would have been practicing the same thing and adapting the same idea that, that we are traveling with Jesus, joining him in what he wants to do in the kingdom of God. So watch this. I think you're going to enjoy it. Build it. For thousands of years, we have done this. Thousands. Make a structure, we are told. Not a permanent one, for we are wanderers. Make a temporary structure. Build it up, piece by piece. It needs to be strong, but not too strong, because we are not invincible, and neither should this be. It needs to be private, but not too private, because we are not separate from our fellow creatures as much as we think we ought to be. It needs to be safe, but not too safe, because we're not safe from everything we wish to be safe from. Leave it open for guests to feel welcome. If you build it, they will come. Cover the sky, but not too much. You should be able to see the stars. We are told that we will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and we should look at them from our temporary, not entirely strong, not completely private, and not totally safe, temporary structure. Make it pretty. This will be your home for eight days. Decorate it, light it up. Take willow, myrtle, date palm, and an etrogue, a citron fruit, and assemble them just so and hold on to them in this structure. North, south, east, and west. You cannot escape everything. You cannot run. It is everywhere. Everything is everywhere. Build a home when you are homeless. Make a fort when you feel indefensible. Find comfort when you are suffering. Do the impossible. Build this structure. Build it and watch what grows. Fun, isn't it? And you go, oh my goodness. So that's what our Jewish friends are building right now. And so when you read in the New Testament scriptures that God is tabernacling among us, this is the idea. You go, oh my goodness. As we are on the way of where God is taking us, as we are living our impermanent lives, God takes up residence inside our lives with us. And you go, oh my, oh my goodness. Well, before we, we move on, I, I wanted to try to create a enough of a different sort of worship experience for you. So while we were on that, that kind of Sukkot, that, that Hebrew uh, sort of, of feel, I wanted to come back and, and give you one more worship song that is also taken from the Psalms. And it's, it's from Psalm 121. And this is a beautiful piece. I think you're going to enjoy it. Please listen. I'll 
ניתן למות רק לך, אל ינו שומריך. הנה לא ינו, לא ישם שומר ישראל. Where you go, Phil, I, Hebrew doesn't help me there. I don't get what he's saying. Well, let me tell you what he's saying. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade. Ah, do you see what that connects to? That connects to Sukkot, that he is our shade in the middle of the wilderness. The Lord is your shade as your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So we've been on quite a journey this morning, haven't we? From Nigeria, oh my goodness, to... Australia to, to Israel, um, and in just a moment, we're going to be anchored right here in West Sacramento. So uh, I've got some, some fun things to share with you, but uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, it's not too late to sign up for Jesus on trial, <coughs> excuse me, and I, I really want to encourage you for a really modest um, the cost of, of, of two meals, two modest meals, about 20-some dollars, you can, you can join Jesus on trial and then watch each of the seminars for about the next 30 days. And the seminars that they are having are really, really good. 
Second, um, I wanted to <clears throat> lead us in a prayer for our president today. I know that we're all over the page um, politically. I know that. And I'm not, in, in no way am I trying to land on one side or the other. You know how, how balanced I am. But I think we can all agree that this nation that we love is, seems very um, tipsy right now, very precarious. And uh, we want uh, God's will to be done in this country. Um, in times past, I think there was a really a clear sense that, that we had that God wanted this nation to be um, a, a beacon to the world, and sometimes we did a better job of that than, than, than others. Well, I'm going to pray that God would put his hand on our nation, that, that God would guide us through the next 30 days, and we would, we would be a place that rejects violence, a place of peace, a, a place of, of safety, and, and a place that the gospel can can, um, oh, how would I say it? Uh, yeah, all of that, all of that. So will you bow your heads with me? Father, um, this morning, we pray as we are instructed to do, those who are in governance over us, um, we, we make no assumptions that they share our faith and in many ways, um, sometimes are for us, and sometimes it feels like they're against us, but we're still called to pray. And so we pray for those who are in governance over us. We pray our, for our president today that you would preserve his health. We pray for the Senate and, and the Congress, the House of Representatives, that you would uh, guide them in their work, that they would be men and women who have a sense of of sacred responsibility. And even if they do not share our faith at all, may they ha still have the residue of faith guiding them somewhere in their lives. May they pursue mercy. May they pursue justice. May they pursue righteousness for the well-being, but also for the blessing of the nations. I pray for the selection and the well-being of our Supreme Court and the judges beneath them and the whole substructures, and we pray for even this process of a possible selection of, of a new supreme justice, uh, a supreme judge. And Father, you know that there has been a great heaviness on our hearts all through uh, this past week. Some from our environment, the fires that, that are roaring and filling our, our atmosphere with smoke. That there is a heaviness because of the pandemic that in most states, we, still, we see it still on the rise. And we pray, for, we, we also know that there's a heaviness because the, the debate that, that took place in many ways, it was, it was a mirror to our culture, that our culture has become more coarse, that our conversations have become angry and bitter and resentful. And, um, and Father, we pray for our land. We pray that your kingdom would somehow be advanced by it that your church would regain its commitment to holiness, its, its hunger to, to live out righteousness at home and throughout the world. And so I pray for all of these things because um, we're all broken as can be. And we all need your hand upon our lives. And... Um, these are days when far and away the most powerful thing we can do is to pray. It's so easy to sit around and choose sides and critique and 
some of that's necessary, that, that point, counterpoint. That, we need to be doing that. But even more important, we need to be in prayer. And so we pray. And we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So what I want to do is I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. And let me say again, uh, those of you who uh, were so kind last week to donate to our youth ministry because your cell phones went off, uh, I wouldn't think that that's going to, that is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, we were just able to buy two new volleyballs because of that. So uh, thank you very much. And what we may do, we were talking about it before the service today, uh, what we may do is we may even start calling people throughout the service just to make sure that your phones are off. Ask Jim. Ask Jim. Why, did his phone go off? Did you really? <laughs> oh, how fun. How fun. That's right. So isn't it fun that we get in the midst of all of this craziness, we can still have fun. I, joy, brothers and, brothers and sisters, joy was one of the things that was so, um, so compelling to people when they looked on at Christianity. Uh, it was that they saw a different emotional uh, makeup of, of people in the church, that they saw this thing called peace and, and joy. And so the, the chance to laugh, and even in the midst of fires and politics and all of that, yeah, we take those things very seriously, but, but we also uh, can have joy together. So uh, I'd like to ask you to follow me as I read Acts chapter 11. Verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and he saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I thoroughly enjoy that chapter, and I, I've been looking forward to this today, because, come on, uh, I want us to go to a place you've never heard of before. I love this place. Uh, it's a place that was ancient, even before the Apostle Paul strolled into it the first time. It's that old of a city called Antakya, and if we were riding to that place and we were all on a big tour bus, I'd explain how Americans, uh, we always think in terms of progress. We Americans are unique that way and you don't recognize it until you live outside the United States and not everybody looks at the world in the same way. Let me jump to a slide here. So this morning I want to talk about the best place you've never heard of. Next slide, okay, it's me. And this is the fun of traveling with, with Americans, is that you have to explain a little bit of how we're different. 
uh, were louder. <laughs> no surprise there. The Americans and the Australians were just, were just loud. But it's also how we think of progress. And let me explain it this way. We Americans tend to think that uh, history is always getting better, always progressing. If this is a, a, a book that comes from oh, the, the early 1920s, 1930s, it's called The Magic City. If you'd go to Rome today, uh, Rome would look a lot like the picture on the left. Pretty developed, uh, a lot of the structures still standing. But if you would have gone to Rome in, say, the 1800s, it would look something more like on the right. All of Rome had filled in. And we tend to think that, that okay, every once in a while you have to take a, one step back, but you're going to be able to take two steps forward. And what you don't realize is that throughout a lot of time, things just regressed. Valleys filled in. It looked like the scene on the right. So, so much of what you'd see when you go to Rome today has been dug out. It, looked, it would have looked like pasture. Here's another example of that that's always fun to show people. Here's the Sphinx. Um, funniest thing, people, they would, they would do the grand tour. They would, go to, they would go to Egypt. They would see the pyramids. And they would see this head sticking out of the sand. And they go, why would anybody stick a head just right there out of sand? Nobody thought that, hold it, there's a whole big thing underneath of it. But that had filled in over time and for centuries. People just thought there was a head sticking up out of the sand. I use that because I, I want you to think in terms of this old city. So we're all, we're all going to get on the bus. Gene, you're going to get on the bus, right? Amen, that's right. And we're going to go to Antakya. Um, and, to un and to explain what Antakya is, and, and you see where I'm going with this, right? That Antakya is the city on the top. Antioch is underneath of it. But to get the sense of, of what it's like when we would roll into town, think of it a little bit like this. Let's say that you had never met your Aunt Barb. She lived on the East Coast. Mom had talked about her a lot, but you and your twin sister, you decided to do a, a trip to go meet Barb. And you go meet Barb, and oh my goodness, Barb uh, is still working the counters at an enterprise rent-a-car agency. Uh, she can't afford to retire. She invites you over to her home, and it's a tiny little apartment that from the outside, it looks like not much. She invites you in, and she offers to make coffee, and you and your sister are, are looking through what passes for kind of a, a living room. And then all of a sudden, your sister nudges you and says, look, look at that picture. And you see a picture of Barb in a gown when she was younger. And she was stunning. And she's standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. And you hold it. How? Oh, that doesn't seem to match. It doesn't look like the Barb that you, you see now. Or you look around the room. And no, the, the decorations aren't, in, aren't huge. But you have small little pieces of antique jewelry that she has used to decorate with. And so over here, over the lamp, are some earrings made with lapis lazuli, really beautiful dark blue. And over here, she has hanging in a frame an antique silver necklace with big emeralds. And then over, right by where she keeps her phone, in a little box, she has a ring that looks like it's Egyptian. It's old, and it's kind of greenish, and it's, it's copper. You're going, who is this lady? And you begin to think, 
there must be so much more going on behind the surface that we had no idea what, that, that Aunt Barb is kind of cool. That's how I want you to feel about this city, because when our bus rolls into town, at the end of the afternoon, it's dusk, and here are older men sitting around having a at late afternoon smoke, or they're eating their wa piece of watermelon and spitting seeds out, and it can just look like a city made up of cardboard cubes. And what you don't realize is there is so much going on beneath the surface. Let me explain why. Uh, if you saw the city today, it's not been dug out very well archaeologically because they built homes over it and nobody likes to have their, their homes removed. But even in the middle of the city, you see these cues, like that scene with the oranges. You see these small little churches with crosses on the top. There's so much more going on. When, in the first century, when Acts was taking place, Antioch was the third largest city in the, in the entire world. Uh, Athens was a backwater compared to compared to Antioch. Um, Herod the Great, you know, the bad guy that we all hate because he, he, he wanted to uh, kill Jesus and he, and he was the, the, the murderer of the innocents. What he did is that he paid out of his own money to create a main street two miles long, all plated it with marble and even had beautiful curvaceous statues made to go along the whole two miles. He didn't want naming rights for the stadium. He was hoping that, that they would be so impressed that they would even consider renaming the city after him. He wanted naming rights for it all. How you have to view a city like this is like Chicago uh, moved east. And I call it a moth city. Because you have very few cities like this in the entire world. And, and how these cities worked is that they were a giant light. And any crook... Any educator, any philosopher, uh, anybody trying to escape bad economic times, anybody trying to escape persecution, they would all be drawn to a place like Antioch. And that's what we have in the New Testament. It becomes the first, it becomes the most important city. And like I read for you, Christians are first called Christians where? Here, in Antioch. The Gospel of Matthew was written here. The Didache was written here. Uh, Phil, <laughs> what's the Didache? Glad you asked. Uh, 115, very early, it is a guidebook for how Christians should behave in their lives. Yeah, it was the first non-scriptural or outside of scripture book on, on Christian behavior and discipleship that we have. It was written here. The church exploded here. And this is the first church of all of the churches to really catch a global vision for what God was doing in the world. Antioch is that big of a deal. But if you saw it today, you go, church here? Seriously? And, and what we tend to think is, well, if we're going to plant a church, we need to go to a small town someplace you know, a village, and start there. What's interesting, brothers and sisters, is that that's not really how Jesus seems to think. Um, the early church leaders thought in terms of reaching major cities. So they would send, and this is what we're going to see eventually, they're going to send a missionary to a new major town, and then as people came to faith, they would have the responsibility to take the gospel out to other smaller towns around. So there was this very clear strategy. Now, in the book of Acts, that's not what we see happening for a while. In Acts chapter 8, you have this crushing, this really, really heart-rending scene of this bright, kind guy, Stephen, who is martyred for his faith. Up until this point, and, and it's been somewhere, 
right around 12 years since the time, since the crucifixion of Christ, that Jews stayed just with Jews. But when Stephen loses his life, the first Christian martyr, the Acts tells us that all of a sudden persecution took place and people left. That hadn't taken place before. Now Christians for the first time are going, so where, where do we go from, from here? It will be another three chapters until we get to these verses for today. But now is when everything fires up. And I know you, you folks are so patient putting up with me and maps and getting all of this stuff together. But I do it because I want you to kind of get it in mind a little bit. So clear down at the bottom there, you see Jerusalem. It has, it's the bottom of the three places with a little red line under it. First of all, look at how small uh, Jerusalem is. Israel is just this tiny little place. But when persecution fires up, the first place that they go is Damascus. And Damascus is 190 miles. Paul, well, Saul, before he's Paul, he gets the papers to go and beat up and, and imprison Christians in Damascus. Now, 20 miles a day, 190 miles, how long is that going to take him? About 10 days. That's how serious he is to, to stomp out this Christian movement. So early Christians went to Damascus, or they went across the Jordan River over into what's called, uh, well, what we would call Amman, Jordan today. But that wasn't enough. Eventually, persecution gets so great that they're going, we've got to get completely out of here. And so they go all the way north, 400 miles, all the way to Antioch. Or Antakya. 22 days. Think about this. If, if all of a sudden persecution got so great for you. And you go, I can't stay here. My kids, my family, my life, it's not safe. I'm going to have to move from here. But moving is going to mean complete relocation not having a job, not having a means of support, and it's going to mean 22 days, most of a month on the road. Wow. Their life was not easy, was it? And I want you to write notes. I've got six kind of key ideas that I want to take you through through, through the rest of the time that, that come out of, out of Acts 11. The first one is that God repurposes evil. The early church had become homebound. They'd become timid. God co-ops the persecution that's going on, and he turns it around and he uses it for his purposes because comfort had begun to keep these people from taking the story of Jesus out beyond Jerusalem and Judea. You see, they had done the first two pretty well. They had forgotten going out to Samaria, and they had completely thrown away the idea of to the uttermost parts of the earth that Jesus told them to do. So what you see is that God utilizes the persecution that is firing up against the Christians, and he turns it around and he uses it to disperse Christians to these places that, that would have been left Christless. And what I want to do is I want to use that as a bit of a template for thinking about things that we see going on in the world right now. For example, when we see God bringing refugees and immigrants here, is that part of God using evil that's going on in the world to bring them here so that we can build relationships with them and they can hear the story of Jesus in ways that will make sense to them. So instead of having to learn languages and raise support, God is bringing Syrians here. God is bringing people from Eritrea here. 
to our doorstep, and he's saying, okay, church, I'm making it easier for you. I'm bringing people who have gone through all sorts of difficult situations who are open to new ideas to your doorstep. Will you be my, my mouthpiece? Or here's another way to think about it. Could it be that even in the hardships and the things that are devastating during the pandemic or the fires, is it possible that, that God is repurposing evil even now? Well, I think he is. Here's an example. And it comes from even inside our own, our, our own church here. That uh, a week ago Friday, uh, the young adults and the others helping in our student ministry, we had 21 students coming out to a volleyball game. There was no concert. There was no huge thing. And all of a sudden, all of these bored middle school, high school kids are willing to come to a, a, a volleyball game and play volleyball and hang out. And I'm thinking that we are on the edge of really an incredible opportunity here. And we have to have our eyes wide open. And that really leads to my second point. Churches default into self-care, for which there are always good reasons. Did you catch it as I was reading uh, in Acts 11 there, that the that these followers of Jesus had been telling the message only to the Jews. They'd been hoarding it. And rather than throwing the rock, throwing rocks at them, I go, well, I think churches always do that. That's part of just being human. We want to make sure that we're okay. We want to make sure that we're taking care of others. But that has to always be balanced with our sense of, of vision. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 gives us God's mission for the world. Abraham, I'm going to send you that you might be, I'm going to bless you that you would turn around and bless the nations. God's great mission is to bless the nations, right? But if we lose focus of that, then what happens is that we just slip into caring for ourselves. And we've got to have great care for each other plus Maintaining God's vision to bless the nations. We can always come up with great reasons to justify caring only for ourselves. I know that. And I don't get upset at that anymore. All I'm saying is we have to remember why God has left us here. There's a reason that as soon as we become followers of Jesus, he doesn't whisk us to heaven. He could do that, you know. But that's not how he's chosen to do it. He leaves us here that we might be a blessing carrying out his mission to the nations. Well, sorry. <clears throat> you got to love verse 20 here. Because finally, God uses a couple of guys from Cyprus, which is about 100 miles away from, from Jerusalem, and another couple of guys from Cyrene in northern Africa. And who knows, maybe it's the economy, maybe it was just their sense of calling. But they travel to Antioch and they start sharing the story of Jesus. Maybe they work together at a falafel stand, I don't know. But, and maybe the workers keep pestering them with questions, but finally... They tell the Jesus story. And the next phrase just grabs me. The Lord's hand was with them. Oh, I love that. People came to faith, a lot of them. Now, this opens up an interesting dilemma. We all say that we would love to have God's hand on our lives. Wouldn't we all agree to that? I want God's hand upon my life. The problem is, is that God's hand upon our lives is seldom felt when we are living in a zone of comfort. Uh, and that leads me to my next, my next point. 
Only those who leave the zone of their comfort experience God's hand. These guys had to leave Cyprus and they had to leave North Africa going to where God was calling them, stepping into a certain amount of risk. And there they got to see, there they got to feel God's hand upon their life. And I would use this illustration or this little image for you. Most of us, as we go through our lives, we stay in our zones of comfort. We go to the same stores we always go to. We hang around the same people that we always hang around. We, we live in our zones of comfort. The problem is, if you always live in your zone of comfort, it begins to insulate you from other people, from new ideas, from new opportunities. What these gentlemen were willing to do was to leave their zone of comfort, that which they were familiar with, and God showed up. I'm so heartened by verse 22. The stories of now Gentiles coming to faith in numbers, large numbers, gets back to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And you don't see them saying, hold it, that can't happen. Don't they have to go to the rabbi in charge first? Or, or you don't hear people saying, well, we've never done it that way before. This leads to, to my fourth point. Leadership teams, good ones, lean into where they see God at work. Verse 22. News of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they send Barnabas. And this is hard in churches, because there's so much normal work that has to be done that you get new things coming in, and it feels like a distraction. We don't have time for it. And I love it that the church leaders here, what they do is, when they hear that God is doing something new, even though it doesn't fit their paradigm, it doesn't fit how they think God ought to be doing, they're open and they go, well, we need to at least check it out. I think that is a wonderful trait for church boards, church leadership teams to do. And frankly, that's one of the things that I appreciate about the overseers that you have. Sure, the church has been through some challenging times. But instead of, of the board sitting around and wringing their hands, I have been so impressed that the sense that the spirit of things that they have is that, hey, we want to see where God is at work and we're willing to go there. We're willing to do uncommon things, things that we don't fully get if perchance we get to see God's hand on our lives. And this has been hard, this pandemic. It's been hard on, on all of us, but you know what? It's also been hard on them because nobody had a manual of, of how you try to lead in a pandemic when you've got one goofy guy behind a microphone and a camera on Sunday morning. How do you, how do you try to do this? And I've been so impressed with your overseers trying to do this very thing. Where do we see God at work? How can we join him in it? How can we divert resources towards that? And what they do is they send Barnabas. So to fill this out, leadership selects the faithful, the available, and the curious as agents of change. The entire board couldn't pack up a, a, a camel and, and ride 400 miles to go check it out for themselves. But, so what they do is that they choose one person among them who has already proven that he's faithful. We know that. We, we already have a backstory of Barnabas in the church in Jerusalem. He's faithful. Second, he appears to be independently wealthy, so he can make the move. And he also appears to be curious. 
We want to send somebody who's going to ask good questions. The church in Jerusalem could have avoided it completely, but they were always thinking in terms of, okay, how do we redirect resources and leadership that are going to be necessary for the future? And they sent Barnabas. I think this is, a, this is just an amazing move on their part. Um, so I want to say, I want to ask the question this way. Who are the Barnabases and Barnasets? I made that up. Who are the Barnabases or Barnabai, uh, Barnasets among us who they, there's a track record of faithfulness, integrity in their lives. There's an availability. There's a curiosity. And I love it as I am around lots of people that I, when I see people age and get older, that they stay curious. I'm drawn to that because I think there are a lot of people, I don't know what happens. Maybe they keep watching too many soap operas or listen to too much country music. Just kidding on that. That was just a free one. I'm not a country music guy. Something happens. Oh, <laughs> something happens and, and we lose our curiosity. How marvelous is it where you see people who, as they go through their lives, there's trustworthiness in their character. They keep their lives available. They don't get so tied down, and they stay curious. Barnabas is that person. Now, what also is impactful for me is that Barnabas is not a young man. We tend to think that that taking faith-filled risks is something that you do when you're in your 20s and 30s. And as close as I can figure, Barnabas appears to be someone who is 60-ish. And you go, oh my goodness. What's happened? Um, is he never married? Is he divorced? Is he a widower? And the church sends him on a journey that is going to take 22 days on the road to do. And he could easily have said, oh, no, my back can't handle that any longer. Uh, I can't do that. And he doesn't do that. So Paul is probably, then we're going to see Paul again. Paul is probably about 48, 50 years old. Barnabas appears to be 60. Maybe he's 61, 62 when he starts his first missionary journey. Come on, all of us want to be retired by the time we get to that age. He is moving into his years of greatest influence. Who are the Barnabases? Barnabases and Barnasets among us. And what I would say there is don't think that it has to always be going someplace else. Clara Frasher, an amazing lady, back in the 1930s, she lived in Gainesville, Texas, about 75 miles north of, north of Dallas. And she had a house along the street where the kids at the local high school walked on their way to and from high school. And she saw these kids day in, day out, picking on each other, um, making out from time to time, you know, high school kid stuff, you know, all, all that stuff. And she said, wow, it looks like these kids aren't really involved in churches anymore because she knew they certainly weren't coming to youth group at her church. And again, I think Clara was 70 years old. So what she did is that she gathered five other ladies, most from her church, and they said, we need to pray. So Clara and her friends, they gathered once a week to pray for the students of Gainesville, Texas High School. 
And they told their pastor, Clyde Kennedy, that they were going to be praying. And they did. They, they, they prayed faithfully. One day, uh, Pastor Kennedy said, you know what, I've got this young guy who's just finished seminary, and he wants to be involved in something called youth ministry. Because remember, there was nothing, nothing called youth ministry in the 1930s. It hadn't been created yet. But he's interested in youth ministry. He'd like to talk to you. Well, we'd like to talk to him. They sit down and they talk. Jim Rayborn started something called Young Life as a result of six ladies heroically praying for six years, today Young Life is all over the world reaching kids. And I trace it back to somebody like Barnabas. And you know that. That's right. And you go, you don't have to go to Antioch, but it starts in your heart. Are you faithful? Are you available? Are you curious? And the last one, Barnabas didn't shut the door. He made space for faith-filled risks. So here's how the story goes. He goes up there. He checks it out. He sends the report back to Jerusalem going, I can't believe it. All of these Gentiles are coming to faith here. And you know what? We're going to baptize them. And you know what? I'm going to stay here. What? 60 some years old, completely relocates and is, re and is willing to completely reorient his whole life because he made space for faith-filled risk. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord and with all their hearts. Incredible. Of course, I think you can see how this story, a story like this affects us whatever age we are. And it affects us as, as a church. Because it's so easy to think, oh, you know what, the pandemic, and, and it's hard, and we can't reach people, and who knows who's going to be here when we all are able to get back together. And I want to say, God isn't asleep at the wheel. God sees all of this. And what he's looking for are people just like us who are open to faith-filled risk, who are faithful and available and curious and saying, God, show us how to pray, show us how to reach, show us how to love. We want to join you in that. Now, imagine, and here's where I'm going to make the segue to communion. Imagine the first time that Barnabas is sitting there And I suppose the guys from Cyprus and the guys from Cyrene, North Africa, they explain to the Gentiles what communion is. <laughs> because somebody would have had to tell them, right? They would have known what communion is like. So put yourselves there. You're down in, the, you're down in, in somebody's home, and somebody is explaining to them what Jesus did, that well, folks, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it, and he said to his disciples, this is my body that has been broken for you. Eat of this in remembrance of me. And the Gentiles are going, what? And I don't know how they explained it. Did they say, well, Jesus is here in a special way when we reenact this? Maybe. Did they say, well, it helps us remember Jesus? Maybe. Because we could divide along Catholics, Lutherans, and all that sort of stuff right now. But I'm sure they weren't having those discussions. You just have a bunch of Gentiles going, okay, if this is what we're supposed to do. And so they broke the bread. And so I want you to pull off that first little layer there. And with our brothers and sisters, Jews and Gentiles, all of us far from home. They held up the bread and they said, Jesus promises to be our bread. Jesus is our sustenance. 
Jesus is our life. And gang, we eat this together. Will you join me? And if we have it right, they didn't just tack it in, tack it on at the end of a service. They built it around meals. So maybe in the middle of the meal, they, they brought out a new loaf of bread and practiced it together. And then at the end of the meal, after the eating and the drinking, they said, okay, now bring out the good stuff. This is, this is what we do together. We celebrate the other part of what our Lord promised. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's the new vow. It's the new promise that I am making to all of you. And as we drink this, this wine, it reminds us of the sacrifice of his life, which is the signature on his check. And his checks are good. He can be depended on. So brothers and sisters, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, male and female, let's come together. He has made us one. Let's drink. Imagine, the reason that we are sitting here today is because those two guys from Cyprus and Cyrene went up to Antioch. Barnabas went up to Antioch, and the church really takes off from there. We owe a debt to them, don't we? So that's why when I say, the best place you've never heard of, Antakya, I'm really talking Antioch, and I'm going, wow, this is a place where, this is the first place where God's people get a vision for the world. This is the place. Will you pray with me? Father, um, oh, it's been sweet to be with each other today. To sing along with Nigerians and Australians and Israelis. To travel to uh, southern Turkey along with Barnabas. Our story is part of the great grand story that you are telling through the ages. And you invite us to be part of that. And we thank you for that, and we pray that you would help us to move out of those zones of comfort that we settle into. Zones of familiarity. And we open ourselves to faith-filled risks. They're going to be different for each one of us. But keep us alive, keep us curious, keep us faithful, and keep us available. I pray your blessing upon our life together as a church. Uh, the pandemic has been challenging, but you've given us a vision to care well for each other, but also to bless the nations, and may we do that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. amen. Good to be with you today, everyone. Uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to leave out here today. We're going to follow our, our guidelines, and team, I'd like you to play the song that we would have played during communion, and, and if, it's, if it feels good to you here, folks, to sit and listen to it, enjoy it, but if not, go outside and stay healthy. Oh, hey.